Hello again, everyone. I'm Mike Goucher, and welcome to uh, Marquette University Law School, the virtual law school. This is On the Issues Online, our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers. People are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. And today we are joined by the City of Milwaukee Health Commissioner, Dr. Jeanette Kowalik, who has been one of the individuals uh, helping lead the city's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Commissioner, great to have you with us today. I know these are busy times. Let's start off, I guess, with the the data that uh, that we know at this moment in time. How many cases are we seeing in Milwaukee, Milwaukee County? Uh, unfortunately, how many deaths are we talking about in this area? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's great to be on to provide some updated information. Uh, where we're at right now as of the 19th of May at 8 a.m. is about 5,071 cases in Milwaukee County. Um, the city of Milwaukee is, is about 3,882. And as far as fatalities, we're at 240 at the county level and 157 at the city level. Uh, let's talk about testing right now, uh, Commissioner. How extensive is the testing in the city of Milwaukee? What are you learning from that testing? Yes, so testing definitely has increased quite a bit uh, as testing supplies have been more available or made more available to the public. Early on in our response, again, our first case was on Friday the 13th in the month of March, uh, the testing was extremely limited. It was uh, mainly focused on people that were in the hospital. So that's why we had a high hospitalization rate. Uh, we're seeing that number go down as the criteria has been brought. And basically anyone with symptoms needs to get tested for COVID-19. And symptoms meaning now they're updated um, because there's additional research that's happening. So we're learning more about COVID-19. Uh, so just giving a, a clear sense of what symptoms are now. Uh, symptoms include loss of taste and smell, uh, body aches, uh, sore throat, cough, uh, shortness of breath, fever, chills, uh, and then also uh, GI issues, diarrhea, and things like that. So um, if you have any of those issues uh, and things are worsening, uh, definitely get tested for COVID-19. So there's more testing opportunities. Yeah. There's community testing sites now in the city of of Milwaukee. The federally qualified health centers, all five, offer uh, COVID-19 testing, and that's a great resource for people that don't have insurance. And then also um, there's two community testing sites, on a, one on the north side uh, at Midtown, and then one on the south side at Lumos, and the National Guard is standing up uh, testing at both of those locations. How has the response commissioner been at those two sites, the one at uh, Midtown near 60th and Capitol, and the one at, I think it's the 2700 block of Chase near south side uh, in Milwaukee? Oh, definitely. They've been booming ever since they opened up. So last week, uh, those testing sites went online. And as of yesterday, uh, just uh, yesterday's numbers alone, there were about a thousand uh, people that were tested at UMOS or at the South Side location, and 739 people were tested at the uh, North Side location at Midtown. We have seen, and, and I know you've talked about this, others have too, we, we have seen pretty jarring racial disparities in, in the way this, uh, this virus has affected our community. Uh, how much of the burden of this virus has fallen on communities of color in Milwaukee? Yes, so I, I just wanna highlight the importance of testing and um, con contact tracing and just really looking at the impact of COVID-19 by race and ethnicity. Uh, the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County, we were one of the first in the country to uh, share what that was looking like. Um, public health, we always look at racial and ethnic data. We always collect that level of information. But uh, it was early on where we started seeing some disturbing um, patterns of disease uh, incidents in the African-American community in Milwaukee. Uh, at early on, uh, the majority of cases were African-American. We saw uh, initial cluster of African-American middle-aged men uh, that were the majority of cases. And over time, that's uh, changed. Now we're seeing uh, increase or uptick of uh, Latinx or Hispanic individuals that um, are being impacted by COVID-19. And we have learned that um, some of that, that infection is associated with places of employment. So we have people that work at some of these um, facilities, these uh, food processing facilities uh, that are coming home home and they're you know infected and they're uh, spreading it in their communities so 
uh, definitely uh, opportunities for intervention. Uh, the health department has been engaged with uh, some of these businesses. Now that the state has declared an outbreak of any um, non-clinical or medical facility that has two cases, it's considered an active outbreak. So that was helpful for us to get that green light from the state so we can begin to intervene. You, you've mentioned uh, uh, contact tracing. Uh, bring us up to date on those efforts. Uh, I know at the beginning of this process, um, you know, it was hard to have as many people as you would need to do this work. Uh, how many people are doing contact tracing? And, and for the people watching this, explain briefly, if you would, the value in doing contact tracing. So contact tracing is one of the hallmark um, features of public health investigation. So it's essentially finding people that either have the disease, so they've been tested, and you're trying to track them down to let them know that they're positive for whatever the reportable disease is. And then also people that have been um, considered high risk or exposed to those people that, that are actual cases or people that are positive for COVID-19 in this instance. So it's very concerning to us because you know we, we're very mindful of the time element of this. You know, Once we find out someone is positive from the lab, that also uh, plays into some delays in notification too. But once we find out, then wherever that person lives, the health department of uh, their residence is responsible for reaching out to them. So if you know I um, live in Shorewood, then the North Shore Health Department will contact me. If I live in the city of Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee will contact me. So uh, obviously the health department has been through a number of challenges over the years. So we had a very small group of nurses that were working on the contact tracing in, in the beginning stages. And obviously as we had more cases, there was definitely uh, some concerns about being able to keep up with this, the groundswell of cases. So uh, some of the other health departments in Milwaukee County uh, had offered support. Uh, so they assisted with some of the early on um, contact tracing follow-up. And then the state was working on bringing contact tracers online to provide some support. So the state had brought on, I believe, 100 uh, contact tracers to assist. And those individuals are still um, providing support. So it's a matter of the Milwaukee Health Department increasing our initial um, bandwidth, then using any additional bandwidth from the surrounding areas and then the state. So right now we're at about 150 contact tracers and we initially had, I think like 12 or something like that. It was a very low number. So we're very happy that there has been this level of support and understanding of the significance of contact tracing to be able to, as the governor says, box in COVID-19. So we're also planning on increasing that number of contact tracers to 200. So uh, you, you might wonder how do we get that many people uh, considering that we had such a low amount to begin with. And we've reassigned some health department staff from other areas to uh, the COVID-19 response. And then we also have brought on uh, nurses from the Milwaukee Public Schools to provide some support. And then we also have brought on some additional city staff. So as there's you know concerns about budget and furlough and all of that, we've been able to um, redeploy staff from other city departments to help with our response. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel, as the city's top health official, do you, do you feel that we're turning the corner in some way on this virus? Well, definitely as far as the deaths are concerned, uh, we're seeing that the average of deaths was about four to five a day, and now it's down to like one to two a day, which is great because the whole point of this is to save lives. So uh, we need to continue to bring that down. We need to get that down to zero. Uh, but we still also measure people that are uh, hospitalized as well, people that are in the ICU, people that are on ventilators. Uh, that data is um, managed by the healthcare systems in our area. And then also uh, looking at detecting the disease. So we can assume you know, that we have COVID in our community. It's not going away. Uh, we're also concerned about the summertime and warmer weather where we're going to see more people congregating and spending time, especially as a lot of things are closed, um, people are like, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so we're very concerned uh, that we'll continue to see some upticks in cases as the summer goes about. Uh, but we also are concerned too, because you know what happened last week, uh, the Supreme Court ruling as far as um, declaring um, the governor's order as unconstitutional. However, that 
allowed us at the local level to make decisions based off of what our community needs. So uh, mm -hmm. we did get that opinion from the uh, attorney general call uh, over the weekend that we are allowed to still have local orders to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. So the city of Milwaukee will continue to have an order. There's no date on it as far as ending it. It's based off of the criteria. So decline in cases, decline in deaths, um, increased testing, in increased contact tracing, uh, and then as we're, we're seeing these, you know, numbers go down, that we can look at reopening the full spectrum. So. I, I was going to say, because it seems like you are checking a number of those boxes right now. The number of deaths are going down, the testing's going up. Um, uh, it seems like it, it seems to be moving in the right direction. Is, is there... You say there's no uh, uh, time where you're necessarily going to say we're reopening, but uh, it, it sounds like you're not that far away from something like that. Is that accurate? Right. So we're very um, mindful that there's progress, but we don't want to get too happy and celebrate. And then we're not done with the game, you know, if you will. So, you know, it's very important for us to continue our outreach. Uh, there's a, a number of uh, outreach initiatives that are underway in the city of Milwaukee that are targeting various groups. So the African-American community, the Latinx community, the Asian and Pacific Islander, the First Nations or Native community. And then of course we have a number of other vulnerable populations in our community, homeless, um, uh, sex workers, um, you know, LGBTQ uh, plus people with um, high risk, including myself, you know, people with autoimmune diseases and other chronic conditions that are at risk for uh, death and disability associated with COVID-19 infection. So uh, that's always in front of mind. Uh, and just, again, just changing the, the position, we're like flattening the curve. We still need to do that, but the ultimate goal is to save lives. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. Do, do you see, um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering about what normal or near normal looks like in the coming summer months, uh, because we see other communities uh, around Milwaukee beginning to ease their restrictions, and um, and so um, we see that. Yeah, <laughs> that's summer. our world <laughs> technology. But but what I was going to say is, we see um, other communities beginning to ease that. Is it hard for Milwaukee to kind of? say, well, we're not moving in that direction yet. Do you become an island in essence, you know, in, in terms of, of health uh, policy when others around you are doing different? We are concerned about that because we know that disease doesn't play nice. It doesn't stay in the city boundaries or anything like that. And we know that there's, you know, other communities in Milwaukee County that are um, planning to open up that they have an order that's in place now that it's going to expire on Thursday. Um, that there's plans to kind of phase things back up. Um, and they are looking at criteria too. I think the difference though, is that we have the uh, majority of vulnerable populations in the city of Milwaukee. So we have an obligation to be mindful about our orders and do what it takes to make sure that we're protecting those that are, are you know, most at risk for death and disability from COVID-19 infection. As a public health official commissioner, um, does it concern you at all when we when we do get to the point where we reopen some of the economy in a in a more robust way? We have big office buildings in a place like Milwaukee. You have a number of employers in any given office building. They share certain space when they park in the garage, when they come in the lobby, when they take the elevator. Are there special concerns that go with being a, a city that has a fair number of these structures and and a fair number of people who use them? There is. I mean, again, we're learning more and more about COVID-19 and how it's spread. And there's, you know, new information coming out about how it can be, you know, travel, you know, on your shoes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, reminding people that this is a new disease. And what we're doing is when we get updated information from the CDC and the state, then we take that information and we disseminate it to our communities in a variety of ways. So, um, you know, being concerned about a lot of the industry and the way that things are configured here in the city of Milwaukee, the people are more at risk because there's more, you know, closely mm -hmm. um, uh, arranged or organized spaces. So this is why it's very important for business owners to uh, know what needs to be done to limit and prevent the spread of COVID-19. We are saying, you know, that 
um, a number of businesses are like, okay, we're starting back up. We're going to start phasing people back in. But there are you know, considerations for businesses to still uh, focus on telework if possible, to put up different um, barriers and other types of um, protective uh, factors or, or features to protect employees that are uh, working more closely together to provide uh, more enhanced cleaning, deep cleaning, so that that's uh, eliminating opportunities for infection or reducing those opportunities for infection. Um, I believe too, like MMAC, they're preparing to roll out uh, updated guidance for businesses on how to safely reopen. Uh, and I know Dr. Raymond, uh, the president of MCW, has been very, very instrumental and vocal about uh, what needs to be done to also protect the public. It's uh, it is fair to say, is it not, that, that it will not be a a normal summer. I mean, we will not be going to baseball games, and we will not be probably going to basketball games at, at the Pfizer Forum. I, I mean, that's it is going to be different, correct? Right, right. So as far as just like opening things up and just like, hey, do what you want, you know, you you know, you have the right to put yourself at risk. I mean, this is the role of government. Government is meant to provide some protections when the public is um, unable to do so or unwilling to do so. Uh, one example would be um, seatbelt laws or another would be like helmet laws where we see the data as far as fatalities. So there's laws in place to say, hey, you need to have these additional protective factors to save your life. And people could say, oh, my freedom's being infringed on because you're saying I have to wear a seatbelt. You're saying I have to wear a helmet. But we're like, look, the data says you're more at risk for dying from this. So this is why this is in place. So it's very similar to that concept of uh, public health laws, safety laws being in place to protect those uh, that are at risk, whether they want to you know, acknowledge the risk or not. What, what if uh, any conversations are, are you having with representatives of the uh, Democratic uh, National Committee as they try to figure out what to do about the convention that was scheduled to be in Milwaukee first in July. Now it's in August. Are, are you having conversations about, uh, you know, what happens as, as we get closer to the, to that August date? Yes. So we're very actively involved in the DNC planning. Uh, we sit on a health and medical subcommittee. There's a variety of subcommittees uh, that are meeting for uh, DNC planning. They're still meeting. Uh, we haven't been told that the DNC is canceled at this point, uh, but definitely, um, you know, shifting to more virtual would be ideal to protect the public. Uh, we're looking at even like churches or faith-based organizations that are still allowed to have a, a smaller number of people come together and then broadcast out a service to their members. Um, I could see something like that happening where there's a, an adjustment and as far as number of people, but then it's being shared virtually and there's other types of engagement happening. So uh, those talks are happening. Um, no final decision has been made right at this point in time, but I know we, a decision will have to be made pretty soon because as you can imagine all the investments that have been made uh, into bringing the DNC to the city of Milwaukee. You know, there is uh, uh, already a push in the uh, Common Council uh, to have uh, uh, voters in the city of Milwaukee receive a ballot that they could mail in for the November election. I know you're not the, the mayor of Milwaukee, but you are a top health official, the city's top health official. I'm wondering from that perspective, what do you think of that as an idea? I support that idea. I know there's some concerns about um, voter protections or comfort level with mailing ballots in versus voting in person. I mean, personally, I'm one of those old school people. I like to vote in person. Uh, so like with this last election in, in April, I um, did the early voting uh, and did so when they started setting up the drive through voting opportunity um, downtown here in the city of Milwaukee. But, you know, knowing that COVID-19 is here, uh, it's going to be a while before we get a vaccine. So helping people still, you know, uh, exercise their right to vote and do so in a way that's safe uh, as there's other um, protective factors or features that will be uh, made available at polling sites, getting more people to vote um, and not have to actually go in to vote, I think is a great way to protect the public, but also ensure the right to vote in a safe manner. I thought, I thought I'd wrap things up by asking you to 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 uh, inject a note of uh, optimism into this uh, 
into this, this discussion and maybe end on that. Um, for people who are wondering, people who live in the city, people who have businesses in the city, what do you tell them right now as, as we enter, you know, really the, the third month of, of actions designed to limit the impact of COVID-19? Well, definitely what's happening right now is, you know, like Haley's comment, this is something that uh, we always knew that, you know, there's a, a chance or risk for pandemics, but something at this level, you know, we're seeing this disease, we're seeing how many people have died uh, across the globe related to a COVID-19 infection. And then here in the United States, where, you know, we're seeing just astronomical numbers and, you know, seeing what's happening and saying, look, we got to take this seriously, you know, one death from COVID-19 is one uh, that we know that the only options we have to prevent right now are social or physical distancing of six feet from another person, you know, using personal protective equipment, um, face coverings, masks, things like that. Um, also, the additional cleaning that needs to happen, enhanced um, protocols to, you know, uh, partition people from one another, different scheduling patterns. I mean, a variety of things that have to happen as we're waiting for a vaccine or some type of pharmaceutical intervention. Um, and until that happens, we have to do we have to do what's best to survive. So it's an investment in our future. Um, it's definitely something that we'll look back and learn that we got through this. I mean, even personally, uh, when I was uh, preparing to uh, go out on, on leave to take care of my own health issues and have a variety of auto conditions, how, you know, I neglected my own health and made myself worse in the urgent situation we had, I had to get it done. So if, if anything will happen now, be teaching us to make sure we're taking care of ourselves and taking care of ourselves. The uh, commissioner of the Milwaukee City Health Department, Dr. Jeanette Kowalik, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being with us. Glad you're feeling a little bit better. That's important, as you said. That That's great to hear. Uh, again, thank you. And, and thanks to everybody who's watching today on the issues. Thanks. Thank you.